video. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking today about is a, a couple of short papers. Uh, and you can see the sort of titles here. The, the one I distributed is the paper listed first. Uh, the second paper is also on my website. It's joint with Jin Han at UCLA. And as of recently, with a grad student here named King Song Pan, who's actually, we haven't written it up yet. So the version that you'll see of this is still quite old. Uh, but he's added some actually interesting new results uh, uh, to this paper. Anyway, looking at the, the titles of, of these two papers, I think the thing that is common to them is the timing assumption that is in both the titles. And the bottom one says timing assumption, timing and information set assumptions. The top paper could have also said timing and information set assumptions because that's what both of these papers are about. Essentially, the use of timing and information set assumptions to solve endogeneity problems. Right. And we know sort of in uh, econometrics, there's you know, IV approaches to endogeneity problems. There are fixed effect type uh, approaches to solving endogeneity problems. This I would consider a, a distinct uh, approach to solving identification problems, although it's very related to these and some might even call it uh, a panel sort of type strategy to solving identification assumptions. So it's much less used, I think, than, or much less common than we see in the relative to sort of the fixed effect stuff you would see in textbooks, for example. So, okay, so that's what the talk is gonna be about. Um, I'm gonna do a lot of this in the context of firm production functions, because I would argue that this is the literature where this sort of identification strategy was introduced and where it's clearly been most used. Although as I'll mention in a second, it's also been used in other literatures. So just to give a background, what are we doing in, in this will serve as sort of the, the, the example throughout the, the talk. Estimating production for firm production function relating inputs that a firm uses, the capital, labor, labor, materials, et cetera, to the output they produce. Right? And so we might write down a production function. By the way, can you see the little hand on the screen, Luciano? Can you see what I'm pointing at when I point? Yes, yes, I can okay. see it. Okay. Oh, I, if I move it around and I... <laughs> It's, it's good. To, okay. Uh, so here's the production function. We're interested in understanding how your choice of inputs affects how much output, the, the firm's choice of inputs affects how much output they produce. Of course, we are going to allow for there to be unobservable things that contribute to firm's output, but we as econometricians don't see. And in doing this, we're typically worried about endogeneity. That is, if the firm sees some of these unobservables when they make their choices of the inputs, those choices of the inputs are likely to be correlated with those unobservables. And that obviously violates the standard assumptions we're used to in OLS or in the estimation procedure where we're going to impose exogeneity. And so we need a way of dealing with that. Now, again, there are traditional ways of addressing that. One that's been used in production function context before would be to have sort of traditional external instruments. That is, if you can find other variables Z that shift around the inputs but are uncorrelated with the unobservables, then you can use IV type methodology to estimate this production function. And that would be great if you had uh, traditional external instruments, right? In the production function context, there might be, they might be sort of prices of inputs, right? If firms are facing different prices of inputs, that's going to affect how much they choose to use as inputs, but it shouldn't directly affect output, right? It's just something that affects how much they choose, not directly affecting production. And so that's a natural instrument. That said, you might worry about these, you might not have data on these things, you might worry that those are in fact endogenous if, if the firm has any power on input markets. So while it has been used, I think people have been uh, you know, either through lack of data or because they don't believe that exogeneity is something they tended to have not used. It, it, the literature has mostly done other things. And what they have done is tried to estimate this thing without those traditional external instruments. So that's what this is about. That's what these timing and information search strategies are about. They are about trying to do this without having those traditional external instruments. As you might expect, it's going to be pretty challenging. But 
because it's hard to find believable exogenous variation in a sufficient number of external instruments. Note, by the way, that if you're going to find IVs and these are endogenous, these inputs are endogenous, you would literally need to find, you would need to find different IVs for all the inputs. So if there are three inputs, you'd need three IVs. If there are five inputs, you'd need five instrumental variables. And because of the difficulty in either finding believable exogenous variation in a sufficient number of these external instruments, there are a lot of papers that are going to take this timing information set uh, uh, assumption approach. Sort of another sort of starting point on this is that I would argue that these timing information set assumptions have actually been used in two sets of recent literature these two sets having sort of evolved somewhat separately from each other. Uh, one of these is uh, the literature that started with Ali Pekis in 1996, continuing Levinson Petra and a bunch of papers recently, including some of my own work. That's a literature that's really purely about production function estimation. And I will, will argue in a second, and I, yeah, I think they would say as well, you know, this literature relies heavily on these timing information set assumptions. As well, there's a separate literature. This is sort of stemming off the original pan of battle literature, you know, which obviously flourished in the 70s. There's a literature called the dynamic panel literature. Uh, I cite Anderson and Chow as the first one here. Uh, the, probably the most relevant papers for, for what I'm going to talk about today are the Ariano and Bond paper and these Blundell and Bond papers. These are sort of more general. Uh, framed as more, they're, they're not framed specifically to the production functions, although one of those Blundell and Bond uh, uh, papers is specifically about production functions. But I'll argue that these literatures also, the, the techniques in this literature also makes heavy use of these, or a way I interpret the assumptions in this literature are timing and information set assumptions. Though often in that literature, they're not really phrased that way. I think of that as a sort of a structural interpretation of the types of assumptions that they make. Just actually one point about this, I, I put dynamic panel in quotes because that's how I often describe this entire literature. But the dynamic part of that name is sort of a misnomer here because in what we're going to do, like a production function like this, there are not dynamics in the sense that this literature deals with. This literature that I'm citing here often deals with the case where a lagged out uh, lagged uh, a, dot, a lagged right left hand side variable enters here so this output at t might depend on inputs at t and lagged output like so um why would that be the case well if there's for example learning by doing in production like lagged output might have an effect it might lower your current cost and allow you to put produce more output with a given this in t with a given set of inputs right uh, this dynamic panel literature was actually, it, it, it came about with that type of model in mind. But the way I'm talking about it here is not for that type of model. I mean, and I'm not to, that's not to say you couldn't do production functions with learning by doing. I guess you could with the dynamic panel literature, but that's not what I'm focused on. And so we're going to be essentially, we're going to be using the dynamic panel literature without the dynamic part, because the techniques that they talk about in this literature can similarly be used for models that don't have formal dynamics in them. Right. So the point here is this, don't get sidestepped by the dynamic name in that. It's, we're not really talking about dynamic, dynamic panel models, but we're talking about the techniques used in these literatures to estimate a model like this that doesn't have dynamics in it, but does have endogeneity and in that the inputs are correlated with the unobservables. As I've said already a couple of times, I'd like to interpret what I think is the key identification strategy behind both these methodologies is this timing information set assumption. Just a little bit more formally, what is that? It's going to be assumptions regarding what points in time firms make decisions. When do they have to decide on the inputs they're choosing? That's the timing part. And then the information set part is what's in their information sets at those points in time. And done? Yep. Can I ask you something just just to, to clarify? If I understood correctly, what you're, you're saying is that this type of model that you are focusing in do not have a dynamic panel a structure in the let's say in the structural model, but you can write your the model you have in mind in a way that looks like a, a dynamic panel. Yeah, in some sense, that's that right. Yes, yes. Although you don't have to, 
Mm. But you will see later, you will see some Y T minus ones ending up in places. And so, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I'd say. As I go through the, the, the these literatures, because I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little a review of these of, of these things and talk about how they relate to one another. And for example, yeah, I think you're gonna you, you'll think about uh, the way I describe these timing information set assumptions. They're gonna seem pretty strong, and I think they are pretty strong assumptions. All right. You know, on the other hand, they're pretty low level in the sense it's clear what you're you're assuming. And another thing is that I think they are they at least. They are partially economic assumptions, and that they are assumptions that you could, you know, go talk to a firm owner or a plant owner, and at least partially empirically verify. In particular, this timing, this fact, you know, this fact that firms have to make choices of inputs to use at specific points in time, that is that is an economic phenomenon, and this is trying to leverage that in an identification strategy. There's some other attractive aspects of these methods. Yeah, they're semi-parametric in that they treat a large part of potential dynamic optimization problems of firms. Right? Just because there's no dynamics in the the why doesn't mean that these the firms are not solving dynamic optimization problems here, right? Capital, you know, the fact that capital is is durable makes firms' investments in capital a dynamic decision. So the you know, firms operating in this environment are typically going to have to be making dynamic optimization, dynamically, or typically facing a dynamic optimization problem. Right? And the methods are going to be semi-parametric, and they're going to treat large parts of these dynamic optimization problems pretty non-parametrically. And what I sort of am meaning that is, they're going to be fairly non-parametric, either explicitly or implicitly, on the process governing these inputs. Right? These could be the solution of a complicated dynamic programming problem, but we're not going to end up having to write down that complicated dynamic programming problem, which to me is an advantage because to write down that dynamic programming problem is probably going to involve a lot of other assumptions. Uh, so big parts of the problem are going to be, a, we're going to be able to treat non-parametrically. You know, by the way, the same would be true with an IV solution. If you had in, IV instruments like price instruments for these inputs, you'd be able to estimate this without making any assumption, without making a lot, without writing down the full model of how these inputs were generated, right? All you'd have to assume is these exogenous input prices affect the inputs. That would be sufficient. You wouldn't have to write down the whole. There could be a solution to a dynamic program problem. You wouldn't have to write that down, right? When you do IV, you don't need to fully specify the first stage correctly. You just need to specify the second stage correctly. So the processes governing input choices do not have to be fully specified here. But typically in these approaches, one in, one of the papers I'm discussing is going to relax, the, relax this, is that the, par, the, the structural function of interest, which in this case is the production function, that's going to tend to be parametric. So people will typically have this Cobb-Douglas or translog, although one of the papers, as I said, is going to extend that and show that these ideas hold even if you treated F non-parametrically under some assumptions. Another attractive aspect of these methods is they could be combined with other identification strategies. For example, in a production function context, you could combine it with traditional IV approaches. You know, you, I could easily imagine a situation where you thought you, were, you have, say, three inputs, and you were able to find a convincing instrument for one of the instrument of one of the inputs, but you couldn't find two other instruments. You could combine the timing assumptions to address endogeneity of two of the inputs with the IV type argument for the other input. The same goes for first order condition approaches to production function estimation. That's another what I would call identification strategy that's been used for production functions, right? particularly for static inputs where you might feel comfortable writing down a first order condition. It's gonna be much harder with a dynamic input where it's coming from a dynamic optimization problem. So in production function context with the static inputs, people have often used first order conditions to estimate production function parameters and deal with the endogeneity problem. Right? A simple example of that would be using cost shares as estimates of coefficients. That's essentially using a first order condition approach. 
to get the, you get the, the beta L and beta K without doing anything else. That's just implicitly just enforcing a first order condition. And then those cost share shares are going to tell you what the parameters are. Now, do you believe that? You, I, I think that at least the micro level IO approach has tended not to believe that particularly for capital because we don't believe capital is set statically, but maybe it's close to it. Maybe the first order condition approach doesn't uh, get you too bad. Anyway, my point is you could combine this with first order condition approaches and some papers in the recent literature have exactly done this. Use a first order condition approach to get the static inputs, use this timing information set identification strategy to get the coefficients on the dynamic input, something like capital where you might be uncomfortable imposing a static first order condition. Okay, so just to sort of summarize the overview, so what are the, the goals of this research? So one is to sort of highlight the similarities of these timing and information set assumptions in the two literatures, because these two literatures have sort of evolved fairly independently. And I'm gonna argue a lot of what's going on is pretty similar in, in, in these literatures. Uh, understand the timing information set assumptions better, as I have been alluding to, you know, the key question of one of the two papers is, do they provide identification in the non-parametric context? If you took that production function and you made it non-parametric, would the timing information set assumptions strategy still work or would it break down as you suddenly became non-parametric? And our point is gonna be, no, it doesn't break down. It works in a non-parametric setting. I mean, of course, there's gonna be other assumptions that you tend to have to make for non-parametric context, but there's nothing inherently inherent about these timing information set assumptions that require parametric uh, specification of that structural equation of, inter of interest. Uh, this next sentence is really about the other paper, but I'm gonna construct a simple framework for relaxing or strengthening the timing information set assumptions, which I think is a point that hasn't been appreciated as much as it should be in the, in, in the literature. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm gonna argue, I think uh, could be useful. Uh, another point here that's a little bit related to this is that you know, while this has been used in mainly in the production function literature, it's also starting to be used in other literatures, at least in IO. So in demand estimation, people have often used this strategy. Um, so in demand estimation, it would be uh, for the structural equation, this would be quantity and this would be function of things like price and product characteristics. And product characteristics in particular are the reason people tend to use this because once you have price and product characteristics here, you might not only worry about endogenous price, but you might worry about endogenous product characteristics. And if you have endogenous price and endogenous product characteristics on the right-hand side, if you wanna take an IV, standard IV strategy, you now need instruments for not only price, but also all the product characteristics. And so it can be challenging to find a sufficient number of instruments for all these right-hand side endogenous variables. And these timing and information set assumptions provide a way of dealing with this endogeneity without having to go out and find all those exogenous instruments. And as you may see in some sense, yeah, I like to, I can, describe the dealing with endogenous right-hand side variables in a production function context, which is apropos is that you're trying to estimate parameters on endogenous right-hand side, right side variables. In some sense, IV strategies are constant returns to scale. If you wanna estimate coefficients on five endogenous, one endogenous variable, you need one instrument. If you wanna estimate coefficients on five endogenous variables, you need five instruments. If you want to instrument estimate coefficients on 10 endogenous variables, you need 10 instruments, All right? So the inputs go up proportionally to the outputs. With the timing information set assumptions, that's not quite true because you, the timing and information set assumptions that you make for the first input also can help serve to identify the second, third, fourth, and fifth right-hand side endogenous variable. So there's in some sense a little bit of an increasing returns to scale and using the timing information set assumptions, which is why I think you tend to see it used when you have lots of right-hand side var endogenous variables. Anyway. 
Uh, so it's been used in other literatures and given the timing issues, and I'll talk about a little bit later, with higher frequency data increasingly available, you might expect them to be used more frequently because I think the, you know, how palatable the, these assumptions are might go up as we have higher frequency data. In, in other words, you might be more willing to make these sort of timing information set assumptions. Okay, so highlight the similarities across the two literatures, understand the timing information set assumptions better. The third bullet point here is I'm going to look empirically across a variety of production function data sets, and, and this is related to the relaxing and strengthening of the assumptions and seeing what are the implications of strengthening or weakening these assumptions. One interesting question when we weaken the timing assumptions, yeah, how much does the precision of our estimates go down? Right, which to me is sort of an interesting question. And it's particularly interesting, I think, because you know, in this literature, it turns out that often you, you have to make additional assumptions. Often, you know, especially with the dynamic panel approaches, you end up with very imprecise estimates when you sort of apply the most basic versions of them. And so people have worked to make additional stronger assumptions, add stronger assumptions to try to increase precision of estimates. And as I'll talk about later, people have tended to make this one particular additional assumption. I had this one additional assumption, which is essentially a stationary assumption to the model to try to get more precise estimates. And one argument, once you think about the timing information set assumptions as being able to be strengthened or weakened, you might think, well, instead of making that additional stationary assumption, one thing you could do instead would maybe you're more willing to make a stronger timing assumption. And so looking at the trade-off between these two things, right? How much, you know, how much of a stronger timing assumption would you need to make to get similar level of precision as you might get by making an additional stationarity assumption. Right? Because I think, you know, in practice, people should be thinking about all the possible assumptions you might make and choosing the one that is the most, most of you think is most appropriate or doing multiple ones and seeing maybe your results are similar across both of them, which would, which would give you more comfort in, in, in your estimates. Right? And so I guess the point is, seems to me that people move too quickly to the stationarity assumption where there might be alternatives. So essentially the empirical work you'll see today is essentially investigating that. Okay, any questions? I mean, I, there might not be because I was just an introduction and obviously I'm gonna get into a lot more of this stuff as we go, but just I'll pause and. Okay, and also again, I'm gonna sort of Summarize first the Ali Pecos literature. I'll stop after this because, again, to make sure you guys are, are, are clear with that before we start to talk about other stuff. But let's start. Uh, so, this is the Ali Pecos methodology. I'm just going to go through a sort of a quick description of it. And we'll use production function, in this case, a Cobb Douglas production function and logs to, to, to illustrate. It can be extended to more flexible functional forms, and later I'll talk about non-parametric version of this. The key thing in Ali Pecos to note that looks different than sort of a standard model is that there's two unobservables here, the omega and the epsilon. And they're going to be different, and one's going to be allowed to be causing endogeneity problems, and one is going to be assumed to not be causing endogeneity problems. Right? So omega is going to be causing the endogeneity problems because omega is going to be an unobserved shock to production that's either partially or fully predictable by firms when making their input decisions. That is, omega is gonna be something that firms are gonna see all or part of when they choose their Xs. And because omega affects the marginal product of these Xs, because it's in log, right? Typically a firm's optimal X is gonna depend on that omega. If firms see all or part of that omega. In contrast, the epsilon is going to be an observed shock to production that's not predictable by firms when they make their input decisions. The easiest way to think about epsilon is just that it's classical measurement error in Y. So that means it has really has nothing to do with firms. It's just error in the data reporting of Y. There's noise in the reported Y. What that means is that this is not going to be causing endogeneity problems because it's not going to be correlated with X if it's just, for example, reporting error or if it shocks the production that you know, firms just don't anticipate at all. So anyway, essentially what this does is it sort of isolates all the endogeneity problems in this omega. So what are they gonna assume about that omega? They're gonna assume it follows an exogenous first order Markov process, 
exogenous meaning it is that, that's by the way it is typically called in this literature this is typically called the productivity shock in this literature in contrast to the epsilon this productivity shock is going to assume to follow an exogenous first order markov process by exogenous i mean it is evolving over time and the firm has no control over it now there are some extensions that allow the firm to exert some control of it through observables but not that important for what we're going to talk about today. So let's just stick with the classic assumption that omega is just exogenously evolving over time. The firm can react to it, but it can't change how it evolves. So the firm is seeing the omega. They may be choosing x as a function of it, but they can't change omega. It's just evolving. It's evolving according to exogenous first order Markov process. Again, you could extend the first order Markov assumption. That's not too hard to do. We'll, uh, but again, for purposes today, it's easy just to think about it as being first order Markov. And that gives us this. This basically says that the distribution of omega t only depends on omega t minus one. And it doesn't depend on prior omega to that. Okay. So now comes the what I call again the timing information set assumption. And the assumption here is going to be that at the point in time when the firm chooses xt, right, the firm's information set includes these omegas and does not include these omegas. <clears throat> so that is, since this is going from t to some point, this is saying that the firm's information set includes the omegas up to some time period t plus delta and does not include any omegas after time period t plus delta. And this delta might be positive, negative, or zero. So what does this delta mean? It's sort of saying how much in advance or not in advance the firm is seeing omega relative to when xt is chosen. Okay. If delta is positive 5, that means when for the firm chooses xt, the firm not only knows omega t, but also knows omega t plus one, omega t plus two, up to omega t plus five, but the firm has not seen omega t plus six. So that would be an example where the firm is actually seeing omegas ahead of time relative to when x is being chosen. Maybe I know that you know, two years from now, somebody's gonna retire, and my key person's gonna retire in my firm, and I expect productivity to go down there. There's no reason why Firms might not see productive would not see productivity shocks ahead of time. They could. If delta is negative, that means they are not seeing the future and they're not even seeing the current, right? So if if delta is minus one, that means when the firm chooses xt, the firm has only seen up to omega t minus one, and they have not seen omega t. So when that when delta is not minus one, when the firm chooses xt. They have not seen omega t, they've only seen omega t minus one. Now, obviously, they can form up expectations or a distribution over what omega t would be because they know this first order Markov process, but they don't know omega t, they only know omega t minus one. If delta was, my, was minus five, that means they would only see up to uh, t minus five. They wouldn't have, they'd be making the decision for xt and they would not have seen xt minus, omega t minus four through omega t, as well as future omegas. Right? So this is really sort of just, this is describing, I say timing because you know, one reason why you might get delta equal minus one would be if x is chosen, xt is chosen at t minus one. Right? So if xt is chosen at t minus one and you observe omega t at t, then delta equal minus one. We'll see that in a second. Yeah. Anyway, just to tie stuff down, just to, because you, you need this as well, at this point in time, I, the firm has no other information on future omegas, right? What well, you can't have in this is you could, you, there couldn't be other things the firm is observing that would give them any information about omega, future omegas. So right, basically, the firm perceives the omegas it hasn't seen to come from a distribution that depends just on the last omega it has seen, which is omega i t plus delta, and the distribution of omega. All right. to be, yeah. So the only information the firm has about future omega is the last omega it saw. There's not other things coming into the information set that provide information on future omegas. <clears throat> 
again, this delta is the lag between when omega is observed and when X is chosen is going to is going to index the strength of the timing information set assumptions. And this probably won't be clear until later, will be clearer later, but the orthogonality conditions that are going to be used for estimation are going to come from parts of omega that are not known by firms when making their decisions. So a lower delta is a stronger assumption in our context. So a stronger assumption. The orthogonality is going to come from things that the firm doesn't know. If the firm knows everything ahead of time, it's going to be very hard to find anything exogenous. And so that's going to be a very weak assumption. Right? It's the, str the stronger assumption is when we're going to make a stronger assumption that the firm doesn't know stuff, because that's going to give us more information and generate more moment conditions. But again, we'll see that in a moment. Just some examples of this. I was sort of alluding to this before. If omega is observed at t, omega t is observed at t, and xt is chosen at t, so that is the input is chosen at production time, it's a very flexible input, that would imply delta equals zero. If omega is observed at t, and x is chosen at t minus one, why would xt be chosen at time t minus one? That might correspond to an input that has to be chosen a period before production. So Ali Pekus make this assumption on capital. In their model, they believe that in their situation, right, capital stock takes a while to be, you have to order it, it has to be delivered, it has to be installed. So they're comfortable making the assumption that a firm's decision of capital at T has to be made at T minus one. And so that corresponds to delta equal minus one. That when capital is chosen, the, fir the capital for KT is chosen, the firm doesn't know omega T. They only know omega T minus one. A few other examples, if omega is observed at T minus two, so this is an example where, where omegas are observed ahead of time, because omega T is observed two periods ahead, and XT is chosen at T, then that would correspond to delta equaling two. Omega being observed at time t minus five, that would mean the delta is observed even, omegas are observed even further ahead of, they're observed five periods ahead of time. But suppose xt is chosen at t minus three, so you have to sort of commit to your capital stock three periods ahead, that would also correspond to delta equal two. So the point here I'm making, it's really just the di relative difference between when X is chosen and when omega is observed that matters. That's the delta. And so these are two examples with the same delta, but the actual point at when, when XT is chosen is different. It's just everything is sort of moved back. It's all when X is chosen relative to when X omega is observed. That's what delta is capturing, and that's what ends up being important here. Daniel? Yep. This is Ernesto from, from the bank. A uh, quick question. How shall we think about uh, Variable utilization of of some inputs, like the most easy one to see is capital, but maybe be maybe others in this context. So I think that would that would be sort of more challenging, right? So I mean, for example, it would be challenging if firms have if firms can variably utilize something like capital. You might worry that that even if capital is uh, it can be is decided your capital level is fixed a period before production, that might might mess up this assumption. Right. Yeah. If if there's a choice of how much to utilize the capital, you might be it might be harder to assume that X T is chosen at time T minus one because really what is going into the production function would be the capital utilized and not the capital on hand. So I would say that that would make this assumption this this assumption on capital less credible to the extent that that's possible. Yeah. There are other issues there as well, which is are you observing that? Right now, I, I, I guess that my assumption was that you were observing it. It creates more problems if you don't observe it. And that's going to be a whole other can of worms with measurement error in the a particular type of measurement error in the X, which is going to cause problems. But even best case, best case scenario, if you observe the utilization, I would argue in this context, it would you might be less willing to assume delta equal minus one. This actually brings up another thing is that there's nothing wrong in these strategies for assuming a different delta for different inputs, right? So you could, in Ali Pecos, for example, assume delta equal minus one per capital, but 
they might they're well they don't exactly do this but you could assume delta equals zero for labor or you could have I'm different thinking, yeah. sorry for interruption i'm thinking okay. that whether uh, this variable for instance capitalization we could accommodate somehow adding more inputs for instance thinking about if we are thinking about capital we may think about electricity being another input more akin of labor in the sense of delta equal to zero or some other type of of fuel yeah so uh, so there there are I, I so i can't i i what i if you were making willing to make particular assumptions on the production function the thing that i think what you're leading to is you might be willing to make the assumption that say electricity is liantia with capital utilization all right and if you did that you would essentially if that strong liantia structure between electricity and capital utilization you would essentially you would end up just using electricity in the production function you would take capital out of the production function because electricity would literally be your measure of both electricity and capital because obviously together because they're used together so so okay then it's more tricky than i thought okay that's fine well that, I, I think that's a very that's a really i think liantia stuff gets underappreciated i mean i think yeah i I, there, there might be a paper by Jim Levinson and Emil Petrin. I don't know that, that, that does something like that, that it uses a Leontief in an in, uh, intermediate input to try to get at capital utilization. But I, 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 that, that's, I think, an interesting idea for that. But it's a little bit orthogonal to, to, to these issues. OK, so that's the setup right, of Ali, or my interpretation of the setup of Ali Pecos, where I put this, have this delta in here, which, as you can see, is going to be able to index these, the strength, what I'm going to call the strength or weakness of the timing assumption. Uh, now, to get into estimation, so, so if, if you're familiar with Ali Pecos estimation, it typically proceeds in two stages using two distinct sets of moment conditions. What I'm talking about here is really only about the second stage. These timing and information set assumptions come in in the second stage. Now, there's a whole bunch of issues about the first stage of Ali Pecos. I'm going to try to summarize it on one page and try to sort of throw it in the corner so we don't have to deal with it, because it really is orthogonal to what I'm talking about here. But of course, you can ask questions about this. I'm going to can try to simplify it a little bit. Okay, so, so what does the first stage do? It typically requires an assumption that some input demand equation is strictly monotonic in the single unobservable omega. This is often people will use materials, Ali Pecos used investment. You know, essentially, when you make that assumption, then you, that allows you to invert that input demand equation and write omega as a function of observables. That's this F right here. So before there was an omega here, if you write down this input demand equation that's strictly monotonic in a single unobservable omega, you can invert that in omega. And since the single, that was the only unobservable in there, this is a function of observables. And the point is that once you've done that, the only remaining unobservable term is this epsilon, which by assumption is not correlated with stuff. Again, take, assume this is measurement error that has nothing to do with anything except for what somebody wrote down for Y on a piece of paper. Therefore, this equation doesn't have any endogeneity problems in it, and you can estimate this. Now, there's a line of literature, sort of including stuff by myself, that, that questions what exactly this first stage does. Right? And what it sort of depends on is what these observables are. For example, if this observable is x, then obviously you can run this regression, but you can't estimate this beta 1 because you have this function of x here and you have this beta 1x here. And because you don't know the form of this, you all I take is treating this non-parametrically, this f. And so there's no way to estimate simultaneously a non-parametric function of x and a linear term on an x here because this x is in here. I've argued that even if x is not directly in here, there are a lot of cases where x is sort of indirectly in here because x is a function of things in here. And that would also prohibit you from being able to identify beta one here when you run this regression. You might say, well, if you can't identify beta one here in this regression, what's the point of doing this? I would argue there still is a, actually a really important point of doing this because 
by running this regression, regardless of whether you can estimate beta one or not, or whether it's all subsumed into big lump, one big lump of these two things, you can always get an estimate of these epsilons. And that's really what's important. And so I often describe this first stage, or the main goal of this first stage is to identify these epsilons, which is sort of separating the signal from the noise and the, the unobservable here. All right? And as I said here, often the coefficients on X will not be identified. You could argue that maybe coefficients on some X's would be identified here. But again, I don't want to get into that argument because I'm going to be talking about identifying the coefficients on beta one in the second stage. All I want to do for now is isolate these epsilons. Why do I want to isolate the epsilons? Because if I isolate the epsilons, then I can go to this. I can take the epsilons out of this. And that's going to be important, which, which we'll see momentarily. So that's all I'm going to say, unless you guys ask questions, about the first stage of Alipagus. And essentially, I'm going to say... May, say I, may I ask you something about the uh, irreversibility of capital? In some sure. sense that... Uh, why? I, I, I know that this is one of the problems with Olympique is that you have many times that you can have, for example, investment equals zero. Right? You don't know exactly what's going on. Uh -huh. But why, why that's really a problem? In some sense, you know exactly when the when you have a civically problem, you in some sense know that the only thing that is changing production when, from one period to another is the amount of the variable input. So, in some sense, you have more information like in this moment or not. So, I would say here, I mean, so the, so the issue, the issue you're referring to is if you use for your input demand, if you use the investment equation, mm -hmm. that if investment has zeros in it, then it can't be strictly monotonic in the single and observable omega. That is, you're going to have firms with low omegas that are stuck at zero investment. You have two firms. You know, they both have low omegas enough that they don't want to invest. So they both invest zero, but they have different omegas. When that's when the that, case, you can't do this inversion and stick this in because you the the, the omega you, those two firms will look the same according to this, but they will have different omegas. So there will still be omega left in here. And hence this equation will not definitely not identify the beta one and it won't identify this epsilon either because you weren't you won't have perfectly measured omega with this function of observables. Right. I agree that, but in some sense, you will have a perfect estimation of the beta one plus the bias. In some sense or not. I, I, I haven't seen it. I don't know. I haven't thought about that recently. I mean, it, it, I, I, I mean, I, I, it, would, it wouldn't proceed as here because, for example, what I'm trying to do right now is just get this epsilon. And we're yes, even, we're if you could, even if you could get these, you wouldn't get the epsilon because there would be some, yeah. for some firms, you would, you would do it. Now, there are other things you could do. I mean, so this, you can do this equation for only the firms for which investment is greater than zero. Yeah. Right. So that's one thing you could do here. And there actually would not be a selection problem according to the assumptions of the model. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. No problem. So, so, so again, I'm, I, that's all I'm going to say about the first stage. And what I'm going to just say is, after the first stage, all we're, we're just left with this thing right here. I mean, st we still don't know what the beta ones are. We're going to use, we're going to try to. Uh, the whole goal here is going to be to try to estimate the beta ones. But what we have done is we've gotten rid of the epsilon here. And in fact, it might not seem like it's much, but getting rid of the epsilon is going to be pretty important here. Okay. But before getting to the, that, that, let's think what we're going to do. So now we have this equation. Now let's think about how we're going to identify beta one with this equation. We know x is correlated with omega in some way. Right. Even if x was chosen before, again, even if xt was chosen when only omega t minus one was observed, xt is still going to be correlated with omega t because omega t minus one is correlated with omega t. So we have an endogeneity problem here, no matter what delta is, even if delta is minus one or minus two. Okay. 
as I'll say in a second, not, if delta is minus infinity, where the firm never observes any of the omegas, then you would not have an endogeneity problem, and you could run OLS. Right? Anyway, okay, so we have this first order Markov assumption on omega. What does that mean? Well, we can, without loss of generality, write omega t is a function of omega t minus one plus some innovation term, where this g is the expectation of omega t given past omegas, and where this xc is mean independent of those past omegas. So what this is basically saying is this g function, that's the expectation of omega t given omega t minus one, and this is sort of the innovation term, the part that can't be predicted. There's gonna be a part of omega t that can't be predicted given omega t minus one, that's the xc. And the point is that this xc is by construction, mean independent of all past omegas. So by definite, by construction, it is the unpredictable part of omega t. And since that's the case, we can then take this and transform it into our timing and information set assumptions. Why? Because our timing and information set assumptions were all about what x could be set a function of. Right? The timing information set assumptions were all about when x was chosen and what omegas were known at that point in time. And so this assumption translates to this assumption here. Okay. The difference is that there are x's here and not omegas here, and that there's a delta here and there's no delta here. And the delta is coming because the delta is measuring how the x choices are sequenced relative to the omega choices. So, Essentially what this is saying, I mean, so what, what this is saying is, for example, if delta equals minus one, right, then this would be up to t. Then xct would be mean independent of xt. Why would that be the case? That was the case because xt was chosen at t minus one. And since xt was chosen at t minus one, it's going to be ortho the, the innovation in xct between t minus one and t is going to be orthogonal to that. So that is, there's orthogonality between xc and x that were chosen prior to omega being observed by the firm. Again, just to, to this is important. In Alipecus, capital is assumed, delta equal minus one for capital. That is, Alipecus is assuming capital is decided at t minus one. And so that means, according to their information set timing assumption, that xct is mean independent of kt because kt was chosen at t minus one before the xct was realized. And that's gonna be, the, those are the key moments that are gonna be used to identify a beta. A little bit more intuition here, let's suppose that g is linear, g is this again. So if this is linear, we have an AR1 process. And let's suppose delta equal minus one, like capital and Alipecus. So then the model is this, we can substitute this in. This is just because the omega is following an AR1 process. And sort of another way to think about it is that given delta is minus one, both right-hand side variables, if we think about xt and omega t minus one, are mean independent of this unobservable. Right? Why? Because this is, xc is mean independent of omega t minus one by construction. And xct is mean independent of kt by the argument I just said, because kt was actually decided at t minus one. And so in the second line, this xcit is gonna be mean independent of both omega lagged and xt. And so intuitively, what's gonna identify beta one, loosely speaking, is variation in this x conditional on omega it minus one. In other words, we wanna sort of, the idea here is we wanna compare the output of two firms that have the same omega t minus one, but different x's. And that comparison, how output responds to those different x's for those two firms with the same omega t minus one, that's gonna tell us what beta one is. Because that yeah. variation is gonna be exogenous. Yep. Yeah, yes, and related to that, uh, one question. Um, so here what you're saying is, in order to have identification, once we control by, let's say, productivity in t minus one, I'm thinking that in the case that you know the real parameters of what you have in the left hand side, in, it's actually productivity in t minus one. This y t minus one minus v zero minus 
theta one x t minus one. Correct. So say that there have to be extra variation in x in t. Um, besides the, the variation in, in productivity in t minus one, so there have to be right. some heterogeneity yeah. across firms that make firms to to decide different values of the input, even for firms that have the same productivity like the, the last period. No? Absolutely. That's literally what this, the next bullet point is going to be about. That, yeah. and, that's, and it's yeah. not clear. I mean, that's an assumption because it's not clear why that would be the case. But let me to get exactly. to getting to that. Let me just say a couple more things here. One, I'm this is a loosely speaking argument because I'm sort of talking as if we observe omega. I, my discussion before was as if we observed omega t minus one. We don't observe omega t minus one, so we can't look in the data and compare two firms with the same omega t minus one. So right. really, what we need to do is this, where we're literally doing the same value of this, which is omega i t minus one, right? which is a little weird because it depends on the parameters. So there's this sort of circularity here, which makes it not completely obvious what's going on in terms of identification. It actually causes some interesting stuff, as I found in some recent, <laughs> some recent papers, but, uh, but it does work. Right? I mean, it, it does work I mean, in, in, in these things. The other thing I the other thing I want to say here is that just comparing this to standard IV fixed effects, you know, I, I was just teaching sort of my structural econometrics course, and the way I often compare IV and fixed effects is that you know you have an endogeneity problem, and the IV and fixed effects are sort of the reverse, they're the opposite of each other. For IV, you're looking for part of X that's uncorrelated with omega, right? That's that Z, right? Whereas in fixed effects what you're assuming, where you're trying to find is part of omega is that is independent of X, right? right? In fixed effects, what do you do? You'd say omega IT is alpha I plus epsilon IT, and you would allow the alpha to be correlated with X, but the epsilon IT to not be, you'd enforce that that's uncorrelated with X. So with fixed effects, you're saying part of the unobservable term is uncorrelated with X, which is again, sort of the reverse of IV, which is part of the observable that you observe the Z is uncorrelated with the entire omega. Anyway, in that context, this is really very much related to fixed effects, and it is more of that latter type of argument. Essentially, we're saying that part of the unobservable, the 6C part, is uncorrelated with X. Right? And, with, and again, with capital, capital, when capital is decided T minus 1, it is going to be correlated with lag omega, omega T minus 1, because that's what the firm sees when they choose capital, but is not going to be correlated with this part of the, of the error term. And so it's it's like fixed effects, and you're assuming that part of the unobservable term is uncorrelated with stuff. It's just different a different assumption than fixed effects. It's more based on this timing set, information set assumptions versus the fixed effects, which is sort of more there's this fixed component, and everything else is is, is IID and uncorrelated with stuff. But it but it's very similar. Right? To me, in some sense, it's a, it's, a, it's a little weird. I mean, I'm not in the kind of material. It, I'm not an econometrician, but it seems a little bit weird that there's so much focus on fixed effect stuff, but this, which is pretty similar in a sense, at least in spirit, there is less focus on this. Right? And so even though there are going to be strong assumptions on here, I think it's reasonable to pursue thinking about this. Anyway. Okay. There, uh, yeah, sorry. So, so, so how you say that? I have a question that is, I know that you, you forget about, now we forget about the, the first stage. But my question is, if you are requiring some extra variation in the input at t uh, that is not correlated with the productivity at t minus one, um, you need this heterogeneity. No? If this heterogeneity across firms is unobservable, this is going to create a problem in the in the first stage. I know if, 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 uh, unless this heterogeneity comes from another observable variable that we have control in the. Uh, absolutely, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. That, that, that this stuff, and this, this is what I'm sort of talking. I mean, this answers your previous question and this one. So, it's important to theoretically think about what can generate this variation. What would cause X T to vary conditional omega I T minus one? And that's a completely reasonable question to ask because I just said that when the firm chooses X T, they know about omega T minus one. So, if it just depends on omega T minus one, and there's no reason to depend on past omegas, then there isn't. There's not going to be any variation in XT conditional on omega t minus one, right? And so that's going to be a problem. You're not going to be able to do this. So you need other stuff in the model somewhere, at least implicitly, to do that, generate that variation. 
And so two things to do that. One would be exogenous input price differences across firms, which do not need to be observed by the econometrician, right? or dynamics in X. So that would imply that X depends on all past omegas. It might be influenced by omega T minus one, but it's gonna depend on past omegas too. And since firms of the same omega T minus one might have different past omegas or will likely have different past omegas, that's gonna generate different XTs. Now you're absolutely right that especially this first one can create problems. It can create problems in that first stage of Ali Pecos, right? Or Levinson Petrin. And in fact, you know, my paper, the, my, the Ackerberg case and Fraser paper is all about that and how to get around that problem in some sense. And I get around it by having a Leontief for materials and labor can then I can allow, I use material. It's only the proxy variable that you need that, that scalar and observable assumption. So we're okay with labor, but you're right. I do something sort of tricky with materials, the proxy. I use Leontief, which alleviates the need to sort of deal with that. As I mentioned earlier, the Gandhi Navarro and Rivers to deal with it, they use a first order condition approach. And that's, so that had helped them there. Right? So, so you're right that that's tricky, but it, it, it but remember, that another thing to remember, and I'm also gonna be applying this to the dynamic panel stuff, the dynamic panel stuff, there is no first stage. So it's less relevant there. And these time, this sort of argument I'm making here is really the same as what's done in the dynamic panel case, as we'll see in a second. This is a, a related bullet point. If there was no input price variation and no dynamics, there's generally identification problem. Again, the two papers I just talked about, because they really talk about that. And so there will be a problem with perfectly variable homogeneously priced inputs, for example. Uh, another point here, you know, you, what you'd like to sort of say is like, you know, this is sort of saying that you might have, you would have identification problems if a certain thing happened. You'd like to can make have a full sort of characterization of identification, but it's really sort of pretty hard to do because the DGP for X is going to depend on a lot of other things, and just even writing down a general model of that is very uh, it's going to be very big. It's going to be really hard to do that. Clearly, what if we strengthen assumption to delta equal minus two? Right. So this is saying now capital has now decided two periods before. Omega is observed. So what would happen there? Well, if we continue with the AR1 case, we could substitute in again for omega IT minus one, and we get this. And the point of making showing this is that now X is going to be orthogonal to a bigger portion of omega. Now it's not only orthogonal to XCT, but it's also orthogonal to XCT minus one, because capital has decided two periods before. And so that's going to give more efficiency in general if you use all the moments, because now there's more moments that you could use here. Right? And so that's representing the point I made before that a stronger timing assumption is when delta is more negative. When capital is set more and more before, that's a stronger assumption in this context because it is giving you more and more moment conditions because capital KT is orthogonal to more and more of omega T. As I alluded to before, is you set if you set delta towards negative infinity, which is essentially saying the firm doesn't observe anything about omegas, then X is orthogonal to the entire omega, and OLS would be consistent in that if you if you did that. The point here is that there's sort of this continuum between OLS and endogenous in this, which again I think should, is, should wanted to flesh out more. Yeah, you could do this in continuous time as long as Y is observed at the same frequency. You could do it with weekly, monthly, yearly data. One again, one of the points of the paper is that, you know, it seems like you, you look out there at the literature and there's a lot of people who assume delta equal minus one. I don't think I've ever seen a paper that's assumed delta equal minus two or anything less than minus <laughs> one. Right? But sort of my point is we should you know, think about that because, you know, for example, if we're willing to assume delta equal minus one when we have yearly data, what's that assuming? That's assuming that they're making a decision a year before. Right? If now suddenly somebody gives you weekly data, if you were willing to assume delta equal minus one for your yearly data, you should be willing to assume delta equal minus 52, minus one for your yearly data, but you should be willing to assume delta equal minus 52 for your weekly data. And so why not impose that assumption? Now, of course, that doesn't mean you have to do it. You could assume delta equal minus 20 for your weekly data. 
but you probably can do better than delta equal minus one for your weekly data now that you've gotten so much finer data. That's the big one of the points I want to make here. What if you weaken the assumption from delta equal minus one to delta equals zero? So now xt is correlated with xct because xt is chosen when omega t is known. So what you need to do here, what's typically done here is now you're going to have to lag the x and use those as instruments for xt. So you would use, for example, xt minus one as an instrument for xt in this model. Right, or the, the, the moment condition that XCIT is mean independent of XT minus one. If you wanted delta equal five, you'd have to lag X even further. XCT would not be orthogonal to lagged X, second lagged X, so you'd have to go back to fifth lag X to get orthogonality. Uh, but you can form moments and use them there. The relevance of these instruments, again, is going to typically rely on unobserved input prices. Probably in this case, you need serially correlated input prices to do that because you need a reason for lagged X to be correlated with current X uh, or dynamics. Uh, but as you do that, you need to lag further to find, as you increase delta, you need to lag further to find valid instruments and the strength of the instruments is gonna likely decrease. I also have another recent paper that discusses some interesting uh, identification issues that arise when delta equals zero and delta is equal is positive. Uh, they're not insurmountable, but they're, they're sort of interesting. Just quickly, because I'm actually not going a little slow. Uh, Ackerberg, Hahn, and Pan, this other paper I'm talking about, it, as I said, it basically investigates whether you can use these timing information set assumptions in a model with a non-parametric structural function. So let's just take that model we just had, no epsilon, because I'm going to, I'm not, I, that paper is not really about the first stage. It's just about a model that looks like this. There's this scalar omega. F is mono, strictly monotonic in that scalar omega. This thing is going to follow a mth order Markov process long as m is you know less than the, the the length of time in your data uh so that's the model and in this model we're only going to consider where delta is less than or equal to minus one because as a little bit alluded to in the prior slide the nature of the identification problem becomes different when delta is greater or equal to zero so that's this model, and basically we show with sufficient variation in X related to what Luciano was observing before, F is identified by essentially a control function approach to this. And, you know, you might, you know, F is you know, strictly monotonic in a scalar unobservable. You might say that that's a strong assumption. It is a strong assumption, but that's not, you know, surprising, right? Because even if everything here was exogenous, even if omega was independent of X, you, for non-parametric identification of a fully non-linear function, you need to assume a scalar unobservable. And that's basically because any joint distribution of y and x can be explained by a model with a single unobservable. So that scalar unobservable assumption and strictly monotonic, strict monotonic monotonicity assumption is not unusual for a fully non-parametric model like this. So I'm not going to talk about this slide to get... Uh, uh, anyway, it is sort of interesting. I mean, there is, you know, there is a different approach. So a couple of papers, Dorzelski and Gemandreo, a paper by Jeremy Fox, a recent, this is a paper by Mert Demeyer, who was on the job market last year. They take a different approach. They, they want multiple unobservables in there. But if you want multiple unobservables in here, then you need to make some functional form assumptions on F. You can't have F fully non-parametric. And so they might assume Cobb-Douglas or have a labor augmenting shock that enters in a very particular way. Right? So that's sort of, there's two different approaches to get sort of more general. One is to add more observables to the model and keep some functional form restrictions. The other would be to keep one unobservable on the model and relax the functional form restrictions. What, I'm, what this paper does is the latter. These other papers do the former. Anyway, we apply it to a few production function data sets and I think find some interesting stuff about non hexi neutral aspects of the shock. Okay. So let me just pause for one second before I get into that dynamic panel. I think, uh, I think I'll have time to finish up. <laughs>
Um, hi, Daniel, can I ask you a question? Sure. This is Federico from the Central Bank. Um, so, so what are your thoughts on, on, on using like moment inequality methods for estimation that could have the advantage of kind of relaxing the assumption on the information set that the firm has and sort of having the flexibility of estimating the, informa the information set at, uh, at the same time. So I'm thinking of papers like, you know, Eduardo Morales work where they sort of uh, infer the information set uh, using moment inequality methods, you know, reveal preference methods uh, of behavior of firms um, to sort of uh, recover the information set. And then, you know, given the information set that you recover, you can estimate more flexibly the, 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 the production function potentially at the cost of, 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 you know, having set identification rather than, um, you know, point uh, identification. Would that make yeah, sense or? I, or I, I, yeah, I, so, 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 I mean, so I don't know, I might not know Eduardo's most recent paper on this stuff. I do know that in, in general, I mean, moment inequality models are very hard to apply. I mean, they're, they, they, it's a beautiful method of doing some stuff. In my personal opinion, they're very hard to apply to what we, or, it's very hard to apply the moment inequality models to models where firms observe unobservables. My classic example of that is think of a probit model. You cannot apply moment inequalities to a probit model. Right? If you go and look at the Pecos Porter Hoishi, you it's very hard. You just you know, as soon as you have, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you can you can apply you can do it. You yeah. could a different discrete choice model where the it, I mean we when we think about a probit model we think about the shock in the probit model is some unobserved shock to the individual's taste that they see and we don't see. That's what we think typically think of as the epsilon in a probit model. You can't do that straightforwardly with moment inequality methods. You could do a different model where there's there's a shock in the, the shock in the probit model is measurement error in x or expectational error, which ends up being exactly equivalent to having the same properties as measurement error in X. It's just a very different sort of error that those models work well with than the models we're used to. So I, I'm not sure whether you could do something, it's possible, I haven't thought about it. I'm not sure whether you could do anything similar in these sorts of models where we're really tying X choices to omega. And the, but, I, but I don't know. Okay. They're great. They're, I, I, again, I was just teaching this. In fact, I was teaching it two weeks ago because it was my last course. And they're really, there's some beautiful stuff you can do with those moment inequality models. But the assumptions you have to make on the unobservables in those models is very different than the assumptions we're used to making on unobservables. And that's not to say they're wrong. Maybe, you know, maybe we're wrong in assuming that in the probit model, the epsilon is an unobserved taste shock for the person. Maybe it is better that it's measurement error in something or expectational error on the part of the agent. Uh, anyway, but I haven't thought okay. of it. In this Thanks. Context. Okay, so the dynamic panel literature, I think there's two key differences from above, but again, I'm going to try to illustrate how they're, they're similar. So one, one difference is that they typically add fixed effects to the model. So those models typically have an alpha I there, whereas in the Ali Pecos literature, there was no alpha I floating around. It was just the omega IT and the epsilon IT. As a result of that, as we'll see in a second, you're going to require stronger assumptions on the omega process to obtain a, a simple estimator. The other thing with the, the, the dynamic panel approaches is those approaches, there's no first stage inversion or estimation to net out the epsilon, right, that I didn't really talk about, right? For that reason, you don't need the strong assumptions on an input demand equation that Luciano is talking about required to write omega as a function of, of observables and do the first stage, right? On the other hand, you still have the epsilons floating around because you don't net them out. That's also going to require a stronger assumption on the omega process. The nice thing is that they're actually the same stronger assumption. So the stronger assumption that helps you with the alpha I is the same stronger assumption that will help you with the epsilon I's. So let's think about adding them one at a time. So first add the fixed effects. So I just added an alpha I to what we had before. Let's have the same timing information set assumptions regarding omega. Okay. And let's assume that alpha is in the firm's information set at all t. So alpha is going to be correlated with x in any arbitrary way. But the, you know, this, these timing assumptions, again, if you read the dynamic panel, they don't talk about them as timing information set assumptions. 
what they tip, but they do typically sort of highlight sort of three possible assumptions in my delta notation. One is strictly exogenous, which is essentially like saying delta is minus infinity, where x is not correlated with any part of omega. Uh, a second thing is what they call predetermined, which is like capital and alitacus, where delta is minus one. And the third is endogenous, where delta is equal to zero. So yeah, they, they will talk about these three possible assumptions for x, which fits into this, this delta framework. So what happens? So we have this. So if we have this general first order Markov process for, for omega, we can do the same substituting in, but the issue here is that now we have this alpha i stuck in this nonlinear function g. And that's a little bit problematic for estimation. You have alpha in both linearly here and nonlinearly here. So what the dynamic panel literature does is basically assumes that g follows an AR1 process. Well, that makes g linear like in my examples before. And once you do that, the alpha here combines with the alpha here, and you just get one alpha term popping out here. You get this. That sort of simplifies things, but there's still this issue that this alpha i is correlated with all the x's. Right? The timing and information set assumptions ensure that xcit is uncorrelated with some of the x's, depending on delta. But alpha i is potentially correlated with all of the x's, so that's a problem. So what does this literature do? It involves one of two things. One is differencing, right? uh, and the other is possible additional assumptions on alpha and x. Let's just go through those. So what is differencing going to do? That's just going to take this equation and difference it to get rid of the alpha i. So that's what I've just done here. So if you difference to get rid of the alpha i, there's still the xc's floating around. But we know properties of the xc's because we know the xc's are orthogonal to certain x's depending on delta. But what does that sort of end up doing? That means that you can estimate using moments based uh, like that look like this, where the difference from before is before there was just an XC here because we didn't have to different out, difference out the alpha. And then here it's delta minus two rather than delta minus one. That's because of this XCIT minus one here. So if capital was set a period before, i.e. delta is minus one, right, you would need t minus one here. You couldn't put txt here because xci t minus one would be correlated with xt. So you need to, a sort of one further lag of x uh, to deal with the fact that there's this xci t minus one there. Right? Again, because kt, while kt is uncorrelated with xct, kt is correlated with xci t minus one because kt is a function of omega t minus 1. But it just requires lagging it one more. Analogous to the prior discussion, you know, the information in those moments is going to depend on, on, on delta. Right? More negative, you're going to get more moments. Uh, in practice, and this I was alluding to this earlier, in practice, estimators based on these moments, at least for delta equals zero or minus one, which is typically assumed, often have high variances. And so Ariana and Bouvier and Blundell and Bond suggest some additional restrictions, and they're based on how X relates to alpha. Right. So this is going back to this equation before we differenced out the alpha. So I'm talking about additional assumptions on alpha and X. And their idea is, well, while x might be correlated with alpha, maybe some parts of x are uncorrelated with alpha. And specifically, they assume that alpha is uncorrelated with, or mean independent of, changes in x. So this is another assumption they're going to add to the model. All right. Before, their basic moments were these just on the Xs, where alpha was differenced out. But now they're going to make up some stronger assumptions on alpha and try to add some additional moments where they don't difference out alpha. So that's what I'm doing here, talking about here. Moments that look like this. So what is this literally saying? Well, I think it's useful to think about it in the production function context. It's essentially saying that you know, an alpha I, a high alpha means you're inherently a good firm, right? You produce a lot. A low alpha means you're just inherently a bad firm. You're always going to be a bad firm. Xt minus xt minus 1 is how your inputs are changing over time, whether they're increasing or decreasing. 
And the production function context, this is essentially saying that inherently good firms, firms with high alpha I's, are not growing faster or slower than inherently bad firms. Now, you might sort of think about that. Or when you first think about that, you might say, well, that seems like a little crazy assumption. Like, wouldn't good firms be growing faster because they're good? Wouldn't they want to increase their X's faster than bad firms? And that's true, but that thought process that I just said is sort of, well, yeah, if you start from the beginning of time, a firm starting out who's a good firm is probably going to want to grow faster than a firm starting out who's a bad firm. Where this might hold is more in the long run, and essentially Blundell and Bond are point out that it's essentially what this assumption is, is a stationary assumption. That is, we've gone sufficiently far from birth, for example, such that big firms and small firms, the big firms are sort of on average where they should be, the good firms are where they should be, the bad firms are where they should be, so changes in X around that are not correlated with that. So it's essentially the stationarity assumption. So what does this rule out in practice? You have to need firms that are far away from birth. Because again, near birth, you think good firms are going to grow faster than bad firms. But it's actually stronger than that, right? You can't have in aggregate environmental variables trending over time. I mean, if you're going through like business cycles, I don't think this assumption, this assumption is not really going to hold, right? You might see good firms you know, shrinking faster than bad firms in a downturn, you might see them expanding quicker than bad firms in an upturn. So, yeah, it's a pretty strong assumption, I'd argue. I mean, yeah, I may, maybe you can credibly argue this in certain cases, that's fine. I'm not going to necessarily take a stand on that, but I'm, you know, one point I'm going to say in a second is there might be alternatives to this assumption. And this assumption gets used all the time because, as I was alluding to, in practice, <laughs> The estimators based just on these moments are often very noisy. And so what people do is they say these, these are super noisy, and so they end up adding these assumptions. Actually, I, these are the, the, I didn't, I, I sort of, these, these were loosely describing them here, but this is more formally what these assumptions are going to look like, these additional moment conditions are going to look like. We now have the not the equation before we difference. We know the properties of C. We now know some properties of alpha that alpha are correlated with are uncorrelated with some changes in X, and so we get moment conditions that look like this, which again depend on delta because it, the you know you need the delta in there because the correlate delta it determines what X's the the exceeds are correlated with. So. Blundell and Bond combine these moments with the moments from the difference equation to get what they call the cis GMM estimator. And that, of course, that contrasts with what you would do, what you'd get if you didn't use the, these moments, and that would be the diff GMM estimator. So diff GMM, you don't have the stationarity assumption. And this sort of summarizes that point being the timing information set assumptions are common to all estimators, whether it's Ali Peka, cis GMM, diff GMM. The primary auxiliary assumptions regarding omega, Ali Pecos can allow for arbitrary G, but the diff GMM, cis GMM has to assume the linear G, the AR1. So here, Ali Pecos is, is weaker. Regarding the alpha, the weakest is the diff GMM, because the diff GMM allows arbitrary alpha I, because the only moment conditions used were the ones that differenced out the alpha. The cis GMM is more restrictive alpha because in cis GMM you're assuming that the alpha I satisfies that stationarity restriction. And you might complain about that cis GMM estimator, but that is actually more restrictive than it's less restrictive than Ali Pecos because Ali Pecos actually assumes no alpha I. Ali Pecos assumes alpha I equals zero. Now, Ali Pecos, of course, is weaker here because it allows for an arbitrary G rather than a, a AR1 process, but it does have this trade off. There's literally no alpha in the, in the Ali Pecos approach. Now you can sometimes get a little bit of alpha, you can get sometimes under some assumptions get an alpha I in there, but it, it's hard to do it. And often when you can do it, you have to go back to a linear G. All right, so that's, I guess my point I'm making is there are trade-offs between these different approaches, and they make different assumptions, which I think is a good thing, because we have different ways we can approach the problem. Dan, yep. it, it is safe to say that um, in terms of, of the timing assumptions and the identification assumptions, if you're in a case without fixed effects and with linear 
uh, productivity process, both approaches are the same. Yeah. Yeah, if, if you, well, if you don't do the epsilon, if you don't do the inversion for Ali Pecos, yeah, I mean, yes. you, which you don't have to do because if it's linear G, you don't have to get epsilon. All right. Now, yeah, they're, they're, they, 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 right, you're right. They, the point is right, but they sort of converge to the same thing when you make it off of something. So. Uh, I could add, I have a few slides on adding back in measurement error, uh, which I'm not going to go through. But the point is that the measurement error and the dynamic panel approach, you stick back in this measurement error, it's again a, a, a me very messy if you have a nonlinear G. But if again, if you assume an AR1 process, this epsilon is just going to pop out of this function and it's relatively easy to deal with. Right. I would probably argue the, the comparison of what's assumed about epsilon is a little iffy. I would probably argue that the, the, the dynamic panel probably makes less assumptions on epsilon, but I don't think that's strictly true. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that. Point is this the, the timing informational assumptions are, are clearly key in both. And that's what I want to highlight here. Okay, so end in my seven minutes, which I think I have time to do this. Get an examine effects of strengthening or weakening these are timing assumptions on the standard error. So I'm going to really be showing you standard errors. I'm not even going to show you coefficient estimates. On various production function data sets, currently three industries in each of Mexico and Chile. And this is actually the third time I have presented this paper in one of those two countries. <laughs> and it's, I think, the only places I've presented it outside of the US are Mexico and Chile. Um, anyway, what's the point of the empirical exercise? It's sort of what I was just talking about. It's I, there's this nice bench. I mean, you might say, well, obviously, you make stronger assumptions, standard errors are going to go down. So if I strengthen the timing assumptions, standard errors are going to go down. The thing is, here, I think there's this natural benchmark because so much of the dynamic panel literature goes from diff GMM to cis GMM. They add that additional stationarity assumption. And what I want to look at here is, in many cases, or make the point that maybe, and maybe in, in some cases, the stronger timing assumptions might be more believable than the stronger stationarity assumption on alpha. And so it seems like a reasonable question is, how much stronger would your timing assumptions need to be to get equivalent efficiency gains to adding the stationarity system at moment. So the point is sort of, yeah, a lot, all, what people do is they start with diff GMM, they get noisy estimates and they go to cis GMM. They impose that stationarity assumption. I'm saying there's a different alternative. Instead of going to cis GMM, you could start with diff GMM, diff GMM and strengthen the timing assumptions. And that might be particularly believable when you have, say, weekly or monthly or quarterly data, right? Because then perhaps the timing assumptions aren't that strong. So again, three industries, this is with annual data, so it's not the ideal situation for making strong timing assumptions, although I'm actually not going to do strong timing assumptions. I'm going to do, I'm going to make, I'm going to weaken the timing assumptions instead uh, because of the way Stata sort of works. I'm actually, I did this all in Stata. I'm actually revising it. I'm going to do it in another program, but I did want to convince myself I could do the whole thing in Stata. And I, you can actually sort of do stuff in Stata. And the the fact that you can't do stuff sort of makes one of the points of the paper, which is the two state of built-in commands that are, are can be can do these things are extra bound and love pet. So first off, I'm gonna I'm not gonna do love pet or Ali Pegas. I'm only gonna do I'm only doing the dynamic panel because the dynamic panel, like I just said on the last page, there's this natural benchmark. How does stronger timing assumptions compare with uh, 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 stronger uh, stationarity assumptions? Anyway, you go into Stata, and these are very restrictive, right? So it turns out that extra bond two, you can get it to do deltas minus infinity minus one. You can get it to do delta equals zero pretty clearly. You can get one, two, and three by sort of rigging up your data in a particular way, but I cannot figure out a way to get extra bond two to do the case where delta equal minus two. Similarly, Levin Pet Levinson Petron, I can only figure out how to get, get it to do zero minus one and minus infinity. So th this just sort of illustrates how, in my view at least, the literature is too stuck on zero minus one and minus infinity when there is a whole host of different assumptions you could be making. Again, especially if you have high frequency data. Anyway, given that, 
I can't actually do minus two and minus three, but I'm, I'm going to compare like minus one to zero, one, two, and three. And so here's some of the results. Again, these are just standard errors. They're not the coefficients. They are standard errors on a coefficient that's about one, because it's just a, it's a, it's a uh, uh, production function with just one input. Um, because capital and labor are pretty collinear, and so you know it's not yeah, sort of assuming that capital and labor are Leontief or something. Right? So you should imagine the, the, what I'm drawing is pictures of standard errors on a coefficient that's about one, and series one are the cis GMM estimates, and series two, the red series, are the diff GMM estimates. So the diff GMM estimates have higher variance than the cis GMM estimates. Right? And this axis is the delta. So this is where it's, it's like capital allopecus, delta equal minus one. This is where X is chosen at the same time as, as, as omega is observed. This is when the firm is seeing things in the future. And so as you can see, as you weaken the timing assumption, you get much higher standard errors. But to the point I'm making is that a lot of the literature, basically they start here. They want endogeneity. And so they have delta equals zero. And they get a sort of a noisy estimate here. And so then they impose the cis GMM stationarity assumptions and that moves them to here and they get a more precise estimate and that's what they do. And so that's pretty standard in the literature. But I'm saying is there's something different you could do. What you could do instead, if you're uncomfortable with the stationarity assumption is you could instead strengthen the timing assumption and that moves back here. And the interesting point, and this actually, for whatever reason, seems to hold in all of these, most of these, pretty closely, is that the, the increase in precision, making the one period stronger timing assumption, is very similar to the increase in precision is making the stationarity assumption. And so what I just want to propose, I'm mainly wanting to propose is that that's an alternative. And you know, maybe do both of them, maybe pick the one you like better, but you should be open to making these stronger timing assumptions. That's another way you could go. There's this one, as I said, it looks actually surprisingly similar. Like the standard thing, you impose the stationarity assumption, you get this much more precision. Make a one period stronger timing assumption, you get this much more precision. And here, there versus there. You can see here, these, the estimates of the standard errors get even very noisy. I mean, these, are, these, these this stuff out here is super noisy. Because the assumptions are very weak. And here, here the timing assumption increases a little bit more. I'm sort of running out of time, but that's what it looks like. I ran this little regression to sort of see of the standard errors and stuff to see. And essentially, it is like you know, imposing the this minus 0.8 is sort of saying that imposing. Well, actually, I guess it's over. This is the coefficient. This is how much increasing the timing assumption strength by one does, and this is what increasing imposing the CISGMM estimate does to precision or to, to standard errors, and they're about similar, which basically means that increasing the timing assumption by one period, by one year in this data set, is similar to imposing the, the stationarity assumption in terms of efficiency. Anyway, so let me conclude. Uh, Estimating production functions or other structural functions without directly observed exogenous variation is challenging, i.e. without, if you don't have a situation where you have credible external instruments. These timing information set assumptions are one approach to this. They're common to both the dynamic panel literature, the Ali Pecos literature. I think a main point is that they are more, more adjustable than what seems to be commonly realized in the sense that you can move the delta around and they want to move delta around and see what happens. I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but you could, it's a little bit related to a question I had before, you could use, you could try to test different timing information set assumptions with this, right? Because the, if you look at these pictures, these are under weaker assumptions than this. So you could use sort of try to do some sort of testing on that. And you might be able to learn something about the timing information set assumptions. Uh, now you probably need better data than I have in this, paper in terms of amount of data to do that, but it, it's possible. Okay. Uh, so they're more adjustable than commonly realized, and uh, the timing information set assumptions have identification power uh, in a non-parametric uh, context. I should already take this set up there. Uh, anyway, in my suggestions, 
in the short term, do the best you can to motivate your particular timing information set assumptions and be open to different directions that you can go in terms of imposing stronger assumptions, including using multiple techniques to look at robustness. And long term, I think this, you know, this would start to advocate for data that can match these identification assumptions. In particular, one of the benefits of higher frequency data is that these types of timing information set assumptions might become more believable. So let me end there and I'll stick around and see if there's questions.